talked about climate change a little bit, um, mainly the idea that the Earth has been warming up substantially in the last 150-ish years. We're going to talk about why that's happening. And so this lecture and the next lecture are going to talk about that. Now, the question that many people ask when we talk about climate change and what's been happening is, is it something going on with nature or is it something that we're doing? Well, in order to really understand this question and in order to really understand the answers to this question, we need to look at both potential causes, either natural causes or man-made causes. Well, for this lecture, we're going to focus just on natural causes. Now, when we talk about natural causes of climate change, there are really only two things we can do, or only two things that can be done to the climate that change it. <clears throat> Either we have to change externally what's happening to the amount of sunlight we're receiving, or internally we can change what's being done to that sunlight. And so those are the two ways that Mother Nature can change our climate. So because we can prove that the climate is always changing, because we know that the climate's always changing, um, it's very important to know that, yeah, climate, is, climate changes are caused by natural events. Now, there are, as I mentioned, two main things that can cause climate changes, either external or internal. Um, external changes, again, are changes to solar radiation, and then more internal things are changes in atmospheric composition and changes in land ocean distribution. So before I jump into each one of these, let me just talk about them in a little detail. So when I talk about changing incoming solar radiation, I'm talking about changing our income, how much sunlight we receive. And so when we're talking about how that could change climate, obviously if we received more sunlight, our climate would warm up. If we received less sunlight, our climate would cool down. On the other hand, once the sunlight enters the Earth, these two down here are the potential changes that affect what the sun or what the Earth does to that sunlight. The two things are changing what's happening in the atmosphere, right here, or changing things in the land ocean distribution. And that's really important because land and the ocean do different things to incoming sunlight. So let's talk about this. First, let's focus on incoming solar radiation. Now, there are potentially one of four things that can affect how much sunlight we receive. The first one has to do with the sun itself. The sun actually does go through a cycle where it gives off more, more radiation, gives off less radiation, gives off more radiation again, gives off less radiation again, and so on. And this actually has to do with the number of sunspots that are present on the sun. And this is what we call the solar cycle. The solar cycle is 11 years long, meaning that over an 11 year time period, solar activity becomes high and then becomes low again. And so this happens over a period of 11 years. And this is again related to sunspots. Now, this only can account for as much as one-tenth of a degree Celsius in temperature variability. The other thing is that it's an 11-year cycle. So much of what we've talked about as far as trends over the past 150 years already have this taken into account. So this really doesn't affect anything as far as the trend of increasing temperatures because it's constantly cycling more activity, less activity, more activity, and so on. It's also a very short-term cycle. It only lasts 11 years. 
On the other hand, the other three cycles that could affect incoming solar radiation last substantially longer. These are what are called the Milankovic cycles. Now, the Milankovic cycles, rather than dealing with um, how much radiation the sun itself is giving off, they instead affect the Earth's position in orbit relative to the sun. And these three are eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. Eccentricity comes from the fact that, believe it or not, Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. Let me say that again. Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. Rather, it's what we call an ellipse. An ellipse is basically just an oval. Well, over a period of 100,000 years, this ellipse elongates and then shrinks back down. It, it elongates and becomes more oval, and then it becomes more circular, more oval, more circular, over a period of 100,000 years. Now, I'll talk about some of the consequences of this in the next couple of slides. The next big change has to do with what's called obliquity. Now, we've talked previously about the tilt of the Earth's axis and how that axial tilt actually influences um, seasons. But the one thing I didn't really mention is that the tilt itself actually changes. And that cycle is what's called obliquity. And then finally, not only does the angle change, but the direction that the tilt is pointed towards also changes. And that's called precession. So first off, let's talk about the solar cycle. So again, the solar cycle is really a relationship between the number of sunspots that the sun gives off and the amount of solar radiation that the sun gives off. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that when sunspot activity is high, there's a slight bump in the amount of energy that the sun gives off. And then when solar activity, sunspot activity is a little bit lower, the amount of solar radiation that the sun gives off drops back down. Now, I should mention that this is really only a matter of one to one and a half watts per meter squared. And that's the unit of incoming solar radiation, watts per meter squared. Um, and it just represents over a square meter, how many watts of, of energy hit that. Um, well, if you can notice here, there's really very little variation in the amount of solar energy given off. And that's one of the reasons why the, sol the, the solar cycle, the sunspot activity, doesn't really have major implications on incoming solar radiation. And this also shows you another, um, another example of sunspot activity. The number of sunspots goes up and then back down, up and back down. And again, the average period is about 11 years. But as I mentioned, this doesn't really have major implications on the amount of solar, the, the amount of solar radiation that the sun gives off. The other three, however, do. So <clears throat> the other three are what are called the Milankovic cycles. The first one, as I mentioned, is called eccentricity. And eccentricity comes from the fact that the Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. Rather, it's an ellipse. And the eccentricity of the ellipse is defined by how elliptical it is, how oval-like it is. If you have a high eccentricity, the orbit is very oval. It's very oblong. Low eccentricity means the orbit is almost a perfect circle. And in the event that the eccentricity is zero, the orbit is a perfect circle. So if you ever were asked this on a quiz, hint, hint, which one is high eccentricity and which one's low eccentricity, this is high eccentricity right here. That's high eccentricity, this very elliptical orbit. On the other hand, 
Low eccentricity is this orbit right here, very circular. And then again, an eccentricity of zero is a perfect circle. Now, this, the amount of time it takes to cycle from low eccentricity to high eccentricity back to low eccentricity, 100,000 years. <clears throat> the next Milankovic cycle is called obliquity. And obliquity deals with the angle that Earth's axis is tilted in. The axis right now is currently tilted at 23 and a half degrees. However, over time, it does transition higher tilt to lower tilt back to higher tilt. And this cycle takes about 41,000 years to go from the maximum tilt of 24 and a half degrees to the minimum tilt of 22 degrees. And so the time it takes to cycle through one of these obliquity cycles to go from high to low back to high takes 41,000 years. <clears throat> and then finally, precession. Precession deals with not so much the angle of Earth's tilt, but instead the direction that the axis points towards. Currently, the axis is pointing towards a star called the North Star. And that's one of the reasons why we use the North Star to indicate where North is. However, 11,000 years from now, the, Earth, the axis of the Earth will actually be pointing towards the star Vega. The star Vega. And if you've ever seen the movie Contact, yes, it's the same Vega. If you've never seen the movie Contact, do me a favor and don't watch it. You're better off for not watching it. But currently, the axis is pointed at the North Star. 11,000 years from now, it'll be pointing at Vega. And then another 11,000 years, it'll point back towards the North Star. So this cycle, going from North Star to Vega back to North Star, takes 22,000 years. Now, how does this actually influence the amount of incoming solar radiation? Well, eccentricity influences our distance from the sun. So when the orbit is more oblong, that means that we have a time of the year where we're much further away from the sun. That's going to create a huge seasonal cycle. Summers are gonna be hotter, winters are going to be colder. Obliquity, that's the amount of Earth's tilt, back here, the amount of Earth's tilt, that affects how intense the seasons are. If you have a high tilt up here, you're going to have more extreme seasons. A low tilt means less extreme seasons. Summers aren't going to be as hot, winters aren't going to be as cold. But precession Rather than dealing with um, distance from the sun or making seasons more extreme or less extreme, what precession will actually influence is what time of the year aphelion and perihelion occur. Now, if you don't remember what aphelion and perihelion are, go back to module two and look at the lecture on seasons. In that lecture, we talked about the fact that the Earth is closest to the Sun in January. That's called perihelion. The Earth is farther from the Sun in July. That's called aphelion. That is our current situation. However, once this axial tilt changes, what's actually going to happen is, as it's changing, aphelion is going to occur in January, and perihelion is going to occur in July. So it's going to be more like what we think it is. Currently, a lot of people think that, oh, we're closest to the sun in summer, farthest from the sun in winter. But that's not true. Here in the northern hemisphere, we're actually further from the sun in summer and closer in winter. But once this axial tilt change happens, it's going to be the other way around. We're going to be closer to the sun in July,
and further away from the sun in January. What kind of impact is this going to have? Well, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd say summers are going to be a little warmer, winters are going to be a little cooler. As you can see, each one of these things mainly has seasonal implications. The other thing I should mention about eccentricity, obliquity, and precession is that each one of them takes tens of thousands of years to go through one cycle. So they really can't account for the major change in temperatures that we've experienced over the last 150 years. Okay, well what about more internal things? What about things that are actually happening here on Earth? Well, we could either change the composition of the atmosphere or change the distribution of land. Now, changes in the atmospheric composition occur one of two ways. They occur either via natural things, which we'll talk about now, or man-made things, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So, the way the atmosphere handles sunlight is greatly influenced by what's in the atmosphere, by the chemical composition of the atmosphere. And so, that's really important, because whatever's in the atmosphere affects the amount of sunlight that is transmitted, just passed on through, or how much of it is reflected, scattered, how much of it is absorbed, how much of it is um, sent back out into space, and so on. A good example of this would be, let's suppose that our atmosphere had more clouds. If our atmosphere had more clouds, we would be in a situation where less sunlight would be reaching the surface of the Earth. That would have a net cooling effect. On the other hand, uh, d during the daytime, and that may have a net warming effect at night. On the other hand, let's say we had um, more water vapor in the atmosphere. So instead of more clouds, we had more water vapor. Water vapor is what's called a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases do a really good job of absorbing radiation that Earth gives off. Well, if we have more, if we have more water vapor in our atmosphere, so that's a change to our atmospheric composition, if we have more water vapor in our atmosphere, we're going to have more heat trapped in, and we're going to have a warmer Earth. So some of the key players, I just mentioned one, greenhouse gases, and another key player, aerosols. <clears throat> We're going to talk a lot about greenhouse gases in the next lecture. So I'm going to talk mainly about aerosols right now. So what are aerosols? I'm sure that you've heard the term aerosol can before. Those are the kind of cans that you spray and cold stuff comes out of them, like hairspray or so on. But what actually are aerosols? Well, aerosols are very, very tiny particles. They're microscopic. And what they actually can do is, when suspended in the atmosphere, they can absorb sunlight and prevent it from reaching the surface. So this can actually cool the Earth. I'll give an example of this in the next slide. Now, aerosols can be emitted by all kinds of things. They can be emitted by wildfires. They can be emitted by human activities such as the soot that comes out of your car. They could be emitted by volcanic eruptions. Again, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And there are many other things that could release aerosols into the atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> going back to volcanic eruptions, in the case of a major volcanic eruption, I'm not talking about a localized volcano. I'm talking about Yellowstone. If you've never heard of the Yellowstone supervolcano, um, yeah, pretty much all of Yellowstone National Park is the caldera of a gigantic volcano. Well, if that volcano were to erupt, it would release trillions and trillions and trillions of tons of these aerosols. And one of the biggest aerosols, or one of the... Um, one of the most reflective aerosols deals with sulfur. And 
if sulfur is released high into the atmosphere, if, if these sulfur aerosols are released high into the atmosphere, if they can actually escape the troposphere, they can stay in place for years. They can stay in place for years. And if they stay in place for years, they can basically coat our entire stratosphere with sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid does a really good job of reflecting sunlight. If it reflects that sunlight, that means less sunlight is coming down to the surface. It can result in dramatic cooling near the surface. So yes, volcanic eruptions can emit lots of volcanic ash and lots of volcanic aerosols that can then cool the earth. Now, have we ever seen this happen in our, in our lifetimes? Well, depending on your age, maybe you haven't, but maybe you have. A good example of this, Mount Pinatubo. In 1991, so just a few years after I was born, a major volcanic eruption occurred in Indonesia. And this volcanic eruption released so many aerosols, so much soot into the atmosphere they covered the entire globe, dimming incoming sunlight, resulting in a global cooling of 0.5 degrees Celsius, so half a degree Celsius. Half a degree Celsius in just a year. So that was a pretty big eruption, but there have been bigger. For example, in 1815, there was another volcano near Indonesia called Mount Tambora. And when Mount Tambora erupted, it emitted so much soot and so many aerosols into the atmosphere that it actually cooled temperatures across much of Europe and North America by two, three, four degrees, resulting in a dramatic cooling in the year 1816. And in fact, there were some cases in 1816 where areas were getting snow in July. And that is often referred to as the year without a summer. And this is a, an image of the year without a summer. And this painting was made by a gentleman named J.M.W. Turner. And what this image depicts was a beautiful yet really cold year. Beautiful yet really cold year. And there were many other artists that also created paintings during this time that, that depicted really cold temperatures. Now, one other thing about volcanoes before I finish up this lecture is there's a myth out there that volcanoes release more carbon dioxide than we do. Well, if you actually took the average volcanic emissions over a year, it would equate to, at most, 319 million tons a year of carbon dioxide. And, and that's the most generous estimate. Whereas if you also estimated the amount of human carbon releases from things such as burning of fossil fuels, things that we do like driving, uh, electricity power, changes in agriculture, all of those things result in the release of, on average, over 29 billion tons a year of carbon dioxide. Now, this sounds good on paper, but let me actually give you an example. In 2010, there was a volcano in Iceland, and... Um, it, it, look back, uh, Google search, 2010 Iceland Volcano. Uh, I can't pronounce the name for the life of me, and I would never expect anybody else to. Well, this volcano erupted in 2010, and it just so happened to spew volcanic ash over most of the European mainland. Well, planes can't fly in, in volcanic ash. As a result, because planes couldn't fly, they were grounded. Well, if you actually measured the amount of carbon dioxide being released 
over the European mainland, it actually dropped 60% during the time that the planes were grounded. So even though the volcano was releasing some carbon dioxide, which volcanoes do release some carbon dioxide, even though it was releasing some carbon dioxide, it wasn't releasing enough to make up for what was being lost by grounding flights. So that's just one example. Now, the last potential way that natural climate changes can occur <clears throat> has to do with the distribution of land and water here on the surface of the Earth. Land and water deal with sunlight differently. Land has things that reflect sunlight or absorb more sunlight, and depending on the type of land cover. If it's snow, snow is very reflective. If it's a dark surface, it's more absorptive. On the other hand, water is just water. You don't get major changes in albedo from one body of water to another. At least nothing that we need to worry about in this class. As a result, if you change the distribution of land and water here on Earth by either changing the total land area, the amount of land that's present over the Earth, the distribution of land, where it's all present, if it's all present in one area called a supercontinent, or if it's spread out like it currently is, and you can also change the presence of ocean currents. And I have a pretty interesting example of this that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So <clears throat> if you change any one of these three things, you can greatly influence, you can greatly influence climate. So, and this happens naturally. Believe it or not, right now as we speak, continents are actually changing shapes. The reason why this happens is because the surface of our Earth is made up of about two, th about two dozen or so tectonic plates. And these tectonic plates are constantly moving. They're constantly rubbing up alongside each other. They're constantly bumping into each other, pulling away from one another. They're constantly interacting with one another. And each one of these interactions results in some kind of change in the distribution of land. So that's really important because that does have major implications on local climate and on global climate. Now, one key example of this is Antarctica. Millions of years ago, Antarctica was connected to South America via a land bridge. When this happened, Antarctica was actually getting warm or warm polar currents, currents that start near the equator and move down towards the poles, and therefore it was actually getting a lot of warm water towards it. As a result, this warm water translates into more warm air. And as a result, Antarctica was once a lot warmer than it currently is. Well, over the last several million years, Antarctica pulled away from South America. That land bridge broke off. And once it did, a sweeping ocean current wrapped around all of Antarctica called the West Wind Drift. And when the West Wind Drift formed, it cut Antarctica off from the warm ocean currents to the north. As a result, Antarctica became the icy, snowy place we know of today. So, 50 million years ago, Antarctica and South America were connected. And as a result, Antarctica actually had access to many warm currents that carried water from near the equator down towards Antarctica. And this made Antarctica warm. Well, once this land bridge broke off, which it did several million years ago. Once it did, this ocean current called the West Wind Drift wrapped around Antarctica, cutting off these warm ocean currents. And as a result, Antarctica is now substantially colder. So just to review, 
there are several things that we can do to change climate naturally or several natural forces that change climate. But they're really summed up in two things, either changing the amount of sunlight we receive or changing what the earth does to that sunlight. To change the amount of sunlight the earth receives, the ways that things change are either through sunspot cycles or through one of the three Milankovic cycles. On the other hand, to change what the earth does to this, <clears throat> this heat that it receives from the sun, you could either change the composition of the atmosphere, which is pretty easy to do. Like I said, the eruption of a volcano such as Mount Pinatubo can immediately change the climate, or you change the land ocean distribution. Now, the land ocean distribution, that takes millions of years to change. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to talk more about how we change the chemistry of the atmosphere and what we as humans are doing to change the chemistry of the atmosphere. Until next time, thank you for watching.